Hello, this is Father Gregory Pine, and welcome back to this most recent installment of Off Campus Conversations. I'm very delighted today be, to be joined by uh, Dr. Russell Hittinger. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode, Dr. Hittinger. Yes, my pleasure. So many of those who listen to the Thomistic Institute podcast will be familiar with you from contributions to that podcast and to a wide variety of other engagements uh, in both popular and in academic modes. For those who don't know you, uh, would you mind just saying a word of introduction, who you are, where you're from, where you have taught, um, and what you're currently engaged in? Uh, Professor Russell Hittinger, I am supposed to be retired, but I keep on giving lectures for Dominicans. Uh, <laughs> currently, I teach in the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology at the Graduate Theological Union, Berkeley. And I hold the position of a research professor in the School of Philosophy at CUA. And uh, I am now a co-director of the program in Catholic Political Thought, also at the Catholic University of America under the Institute for Human Ecology. So in that capacity, uh, you recently gave a lecture at Catholic University of America uh, under the auspices of Institute for Human Ecology, the Thomistic Institute. There was also uh, a co-sponsorship there by Professor Joel Alisea uh, with this kind of broad-based concern for originalism there at Catholic University of America. And you spoke uh, specifically on the principle of separation of church and state. That's a little bit of a crass reduction, but you spoke about, you know, the two swords. Um, and you began the lecture with a description of renative prudence uh, and how governing in contingent things is going to always involve the types of judgments which you subsequently line up and then, you know, to kind of take us through. Right. So for us to maybe enter into that conversation, could you say a brief word about renative prudence? It's not something that we often hear about. Yeah, so Thomas uh, has a very interesting distinction among the various kinds of prudence. Uh, you will find this in the Secunda Secundae, especially, but also in the Prima Secundae of the Summa, that by regnative prudence, he means the prudence of someone who governs a complete community. Although by analogy, you can say that paternal prudence is a kind of regnative prudence, because it's a prudence not just for people's private actions, but for the, their actions vis-a-vis -a, -vis a group or within a social unity of order. But the first example of that is, for Thomas, is going to be polity, because it's the most complete, comprehensive, also complicated uh, social unity. But then he makes another distinction to, to, to complete this. On the part of those who receive the commands of the political superior, whether it be a parliament or a president or even a court, on the part of those who receive these commands, they have to receive them prudently and put them into effect. And that prudence is called political. So this is what makes Thomas's position unique and, I think, quite profound. When the commander gives an order, he doesn't call it political. He calls it regnative. But those of us who are citizens in the order, so to speak, when we receive it, we have to be prudent, too, and put it into effect, because we are not just, you know, uh, Machines bringing out milk, milkshakes to your table, right? But that's what he calls political is on the part of the receptivity. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking here of the different integral parts of prudence. Well, I'm thinking first of the kind of steps according to which prudence unfolds and his emphasis upon command and describing prudence as just the virtue that commands. But then also, you know, at the outset of description of the integral parts, he talks about memory and he talks about docility. So on the one hand, prudence engages us very much in our agency, but on the other hand, it, it begins or it departs from this receptivity to the agency of others. So this idea of like regnative prudence and political prudence seems to suggest a kind of complementarity or a kind of exchange as it were between or among members of the polity. Would you say, is that, is that going down the right track or is there a need that for seems, adjustment? That, that seems like it's going down the right track. 
Because on the part of the person commanding a social unity and on the members of that unity, I mean, they both need memory. And uh, they need uh, foresight. When, when my departmental chair says, we will do things in this way, I need foresight because I have to take that departmental chairman's command and put it into effect. And presumably this, this involves some futurity, understanding of the future. And so uh, those different parts of prudence are going to have to be integrally related both to commanding and receiving, although in different ways. Yeah. Okay, from, from the description of to prudence, you position into a short description where you explain why there isn't one political regime which is proposed by the Catholic tradition as uh, the only or the greatest, but that there is a kind of openness, especially you know 19th and 20th century documents that touch on this matter uh, right. for a variety of political expressions. Um, can you help us draw the connections there between the contingency of these prudential exchanges and then the constitution of the actual political order, whether it be a monarchy or a democracy or something else? Well, one thing that has to be there as, as a fundamental principle is that there has to be an authoritative principle. The question becomes, even out of the Greek philosophers, but also out of the Roman philosophers like Cicero, all the way up to our own day, then the question becomes, uh, it's not up to our prudence whether we have an authority. An authority is absolutely necessary to the social coherence and cohesion to act for a common end. The question is how that authority is constituted. So th the classical mode is to say the authority of one, a more monarchical kind of principle, or the authority of a few, a more aristocratic principle, or the authority of many a more uh, democratic principle. But of course, Thomas holds the position, like Aristotle, that there can be a mixture of all three. There can be a monarchical principle, usually in the executive. There can be the authority of a few, let's say a Senate. And there can be an authority of many, which makes it even more interesting, right? And, you know, Thomas holds that... Uh, this mixed kind of regime was the regime that God encouraged among the Jewish people. That's, that's in the treatise on law, on, on the old law. But you could even say that the church herself is a mixed regime. We have a monarchical principle. Let's say we have the Senate, which would be the, uh, I would say the bishops we'd say today. Once upon a time, you'd say the curia. Uh, and Curia meant Senate, actually, once upon a time. And then the authority of many, uh, traditionally, that would be the ordained. I mean, we have a more complex picture today of that. But, yeah, these, these are traditional categories. Wherever you find a political order of some sort, you're going to find these categories at work. Okay. So then, <clears throat> thinking now about how the church and the state interact, uh, subsequently in your in your lecture, you were describing a kind of principle of separation. And the way that you set it up, you described how, you know, you don't have particular contemporary thinkers in your sites, but you wanted just to enunciate a more basic or foundational principle concerning uh, how the polity is meant to interact with the church. Um, so we have different images in our mind as to how this goes, you know, two swords being a classic one, but you described a kind of tiered system as well that we want to perhaps hold off at arm's length. Um, so how, how might you enunciate this, this principle of separation um, mm -hmm. for, yeah, for a 21st century audience? Yeah, the first thing that has to be said is that what I'm meaning by separation is not something juridical, although I can mean that too, but that's down the line. I mean ontological. That is, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, by the way, a teaching that the disciples of Jesus found very difficult, at least for most of the gospel narration, uh, that uh, uh, 
One way to put it is this, is that the office of temporal government, which is of divine origin, okay, God made a social, and it's a fundamental ingredient that there be a principle of authority, an organization, uh, that is of the natural law, our participation in the eternal law. But what is founded by Jesus Christ, passion, death, and resurrection, and the giving of the Holy Spirit, is a social order that depends at every step on sanctifying grace. That is, uh, the actions which include you in that order are sanctifying grace all the way down. Let's begin with baptism. And the actions that we have to perform to procure more grace and to preach the doctrine of grace, which is of grace, these are a different set of principles of action, formally, finally, and efficiently, than the actions of Pontius Pilate or of Caesar, right? Which are actions of his order. But the church teaching has been, it's always been, that the, the actions and authority of a temporal governor cannot be a part or a direct means to the supernatural end. I mean, a supernatural end cannot be pursued or possessed without grace. And after all, Jesus does not say to Pontius Pilate, pick up your cross and follow me. I mean, it's not as though Pilate couldn't have picked up his cross and followed Jesus, but it wouldn't have been qua Pontius Pilate as procurator. In other words, there's nothing essential to the office of civil governance that requires supernatural grace. Whereas it's absolutely intrinsic to the offices and actions of the church, sanctifying grace. So this is why I say separation, not in a juridical sense, but ontologically. They're operating on different finalities and uh, even efficiencies. They can look a lot alike. They're both institutions. They both have authorities. They even probably dress alike. If you had gone back to 18th century Austria, cardinals and bishops and monks are dressed fairly similarly to the civilian curia of the emperor, right? They even may be from the same families, right? But there's a deeper principle of separation. And I'm not talking about liberal church-state separation. That's another topic. But why the kingdom uh, is founded by Christ and it depends upon grace, there's no way that the church can move souls to the final end of uh, union with God in Christ without grace. And if we try to move souls to that end without any consideration of grace, we will do violence rather than good. Violence means is to push someone out of a proper order. Uh, that's why, again, Jesus does not say to Pilate, pick up your cross and follow me. But he certainly said it to Peter and to the disciples. Okay. Presupposing grace. And by the way, he adds a qualification. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Peter takes the sword and cuts off the ear of Malchus, uh, the, the, the name Malchus means about to reign, about to govern. In Greek. And Jesus takes the ear and puts it back on Malchus as a sign that the apostles will rule by, by faith and grace, not by the physical sword. And he says, he admonishes Peter. Peter does not yet understand, because it's quite a thing to try to understand how the apostles can rule a kingdom without the temporal sword. Um, they rule chiefly by the grace of the Holy Spirit and the appointment and explicit directives of Christ. That doesn't mean canon law 
cannot have certain criminal aspects to it, right? Punishments. But the church does not rule by the physical sword. Those are moral and spiritual punishments, right? So that's sort of what I mean by separation. Thomas uses, well, listen, John Paul II uses the term all the time. Uh, so does uh, Cardinal Ratzinger and then Benedict XVI. What they mean is what Thomas once meant, I think, by holiness, being set aside. Anything that's truly holy must be set aside. And, of course, pagans do that different than Christians do. But our setting aside of something is much more profound than pagan culture. Yeah. Okay. I, so I think I have a few follow-up questions maybe in each of these causal registers. So thinking in terms of efficiency and then formality and then in terms of finality. So my question regarding efficiency is what is distinct about the way in which authority is communicated to the civil polity and then to the church? Because in that conversation with Pilate, you know, he says you would have no authority except it were given you from on high. So contrary to a kind of post-enlightenment social contract theory, it seems like Catholic political thought upholds that at least in its principle or at least, you know, its foundation is, you know, like that political authority comes from God. And then thinking in terms of the church, we speak about it as the mystical body and Christ is the head, right? So from whom flows grace into the church. So the authority, again, is, I mean, is from God. He reigns as head of the church, as the second, you know, the only begotten son of the most high God <clears throat> in human flesh. So what's distinct about the way in which authority is communicated to the civil polity and the church in light of this, uh, in light of the distinction that you're drawing? Okay, good question. Uh, now, of course, no human mind is in authority all the way down because our minds are measured measures. You know, we can only measure action because we are first measured either by natural law or by new law. Okay. So in both systems, both communities, uh, there will be commands that depend uh, for their efficiency on being promulgated in words. Remember in his treatise on law and the four essential traits of law, the fourth, the fourth one, that's efficiency. To actually make something known to another mind, usually by words. Okay. We both do that. And uh, the church also communicates what is of the natural law, and which is promulgated by our, our very nature. But we have plenty to say about the natural law in terms of words. Okay. So the fundamental difference is going to be the end. What is it that we are moving through our words and signs and morals? What are we moving people toward? And the church moves people toward the moral good, which it has in common with uh, temporal societies. Uh, but its chief purpose, it's founded by Christ, chiefly, to move souls to a supernatural good, that is, to union with the Father through the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. And so there we must assume, uh, we must assume grace. Uh, listen, even in our words, if we were to use words out of the New Testament, they're not going to be received without grace. How many, how many millions of people have heard the words? I mean, grace is absolutely necessary to the, the reception of the word of God. And uh, when it comes to that kind of grace, we are given... But we understand as Catholics that the apostles were given sacramental powers. I think we call those ordinary powers, right? Uh, for, uh, but, of course, the, the sacraments are not the only means of grace. 
They're the ordinary ones. But, you know, uh, there's no escaping that we participate in the order to the final supernatural land by faith. I mean, not without charity or hope. But uh, Thomas Aquinas in uh, section six of the first part of Summa Contra Gentiles calls faith the greatest miracle. He says it's greater than the resurrection of the dead. Check it out. It's really interesting. Because how could our intellects, as low level as they are, even compared to angels, make that ascent without a supernatural cause assisting us? And Thomas says, this is the miracle, that even peasants know more about the kingdom of God than the theologians do. Or they could know more than the theologians do. Maxime miraculum, he says. Luther holds nothing over us on this. I mean, a good Thomas understands what faith is about. It's, it's the most important possession. And according to Thomas, faith is nothing other than the Holy Spirit moving the will to move the intellect to ascent. Yeah, and to yeah. do so more interiorly to us than we are to ourselves by a movement at once strong and sweet and more natural than our own nature, <laughs> which is a, a wild thing to think of. Um, okay, so you, you've, you've spoken um, in some detail then about the relationship between the, you know, life of grace in effect and the peculiar nature or constitution of the church as something from God and for God in a unique way or in a transcendent way. So I'm thinking then about, okay, so we've talked about efficiency. Now maybe to think a little bit about formality. Um, grace, uh, just taken on its own terms, sanctifying grace is something that can be lost. And yet I don't think that we want to say that the church's origin and end can somehow be destabilized by that. So on the one hand, I'm thinking of like Lumen Gentium and the way in which the church is described as holy insofar as she is the bride of Christ. So it's the bridegroom who renders her holy. And yet we want to say something about like grace as you have been as, you know, present to the members of the church and hearing in the members of the church. So are there other principles at stake? Are there other ways in which we can describe the stable constitution of the church as from God and for God in a transcendent way, you know, in light of the, the gift, the offer of grace while yeah, somehow adjusting for its so for the fact that it can be lost. Right. Um, uh, Aquinas, in his commentary on John, in fact, John 18, which is the plutonium grade chapter of any of the four Gospels on this thing about the kingdom, uh, Thomas says that until Pentecost, the disciples were not, he calls, he calls it confirmed in grace. I mean, they were, they were being given graces, but they were confirmed in the grace of the passion, death, and resurrection at, at Pentecost. And it was with that confirming that they were able to efficaciously go forth. And things happened when they preached. And he compares it to the first time Jesus sets the, sends the apostles out without staff or purse or sandals. Tough, that's a tough lesson to learn, right? And they came back and they were not doing it perfectly. But this was a foretaste of what would be given to the apostles in terms of their authority to preach. And, uh, they were confirmed in the Holy Spirit. And this can have even what we call an indirect effect on temporal society. Of course, it can have a direct effect, assuming grace, on those who hear. But in an indirect effect, and uh, in the sense when Leo XIII said, that the church is to society as the soul to the body. This is 90% of the time misinterpreted 
First of all, because only the Stoics used that word, and Leo XIII was not a Stoic. The, the Stoics would speak of a spiritual principle of reason as being soul as to the body of polity or society. But we know from Aquinas, including his uh, commentary on the metaphysics, that a society is not a substance. So soul to body can, cannot be taken uh, in its usual sense. Because human social order is a unity of order. And if the church were like a, a substantial form, it would mean they, they have no operation apart from being baptized, which is clearly not true. Okay, so this is what Leo XIII meant. And I got this through, uh, well, I think both de Lubac and Journet were good on this back in the late 40s. Um, here's the true analogy that Leo was intending. The soul is not lessened or less noble because it's not a part of the body. The soul is not a part of the body, even when we speak about soul as substantial form. So here is what the analogy was. Just as the teachings of the church can move those who have ears to hear, and they can even move them morally without the soul or the teaching of the church being part of the body politic. Uh, Journet called this the sublimation. It can take ordinary natural human virtues and by grace and lift them to a higher level without just being a part of polity. Right? Uh, so that's the proper analogy. It, it's a brilliant analogy if you stop and think about it. But obviously the church cannot be a substantial form of the polity. Uh, it wouldn't want to be. In fact, polity can't be a substantial form. So you would ruin it. Yeah. No, that's, um, yeah, that's helpful. I mean, the, these soul analogies, like the Holy Spirit is the soul of the church are things that you hear, but whenever, yeah, whenever you're dealing with a moral person, um, obviously it's going to be applied, perhaps not analogically, but maybe simply metaphorically, I suppose I'd have to think about it's, that more. I but, think you're right. You know. it's, a, it's metaphorical, but a very important metaphor, yeah. one that has deep philosophical roots in it, I think. Sure. Yeah, I recently, uh, in a chapter of my dissertation, I made mention of metaphor, but I didn't give it sufficient, um, I didn't accord to it sufficient importance, and my director made sure to remind me that the scripture speaks primarily in metaphorical, you know, kind of uh, similes or or analogies. So he recommended to me a book by Emmanuel Durand called The Emotions of God. So I'm in the process of reading that now. But, oh, that sounds uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so then that actually transitions us perfectly into a consideration of finality, thinking maybe of how the, you know, how the state, how the polity is related to the church. I think these types of issues are ones that often involve us in intractable disputes. Something that people seem to have been scandalized by over the years is this idea that a church could make a judgment regarding a heretic or a schismatic or a blasphemer or whatever. And then that individual could be handed over to the state for punishment. And I guess a, a classic place in which this is discussed would be in St. Augustine. Um, so this idea of um, this like mutual claims placed by the church on the state and the state on the church in <clears throat> um, some kind of reciprocal engagement, it seems like it's very important to tease out those relationships, the, the respective finality of polity and church to get that right. So that way we don't find ourselves you know, stumbling or, right. or being scandalized. So do you have some good analogies with which you're able to describe that in light of um, contemporary Catholic social teaching? Right. So uh, both uh, Cardinal Ratzinger and then as Benedict XVI and Karl Wojtyla and then as John Paul II, both use a similar uh, image uh, that the church is a sui generis order. 
that is, it's really not very comparable to any other ones. I mean, if you think we're going to be a community together directly seeing God after uh, 20 million years of cosmic dust has ground our bodies up, you're just going to know it has to be a sui generous community. Okay. But we have a similarity to the civil community that's not eschatological, but moral. And it begins on issues of justice, very important issues of justice. And in the case of justice of marriage, that's why the church never leaves this issue alone, because it's one place, it is one social institution that is both of creation and of grace, is marriage. So, boy, there are all kinds of tripwires when you enter into uh, this discussion. And uh, so one of the demands that the church has traditionally made, it takes a while for it to traditionally make it because the church is dealing with dozens of different temporal regimes over 2,000 years. Okay. But is to ask of civil government, whether it be pagan or Christian or today it would be fallen away Christian, I suppose, or whatever it is, to uh, respect and not interrupt the sacramentality of the Catholic understanding of marriage. Basically to admit that the church has and authority over that institution. Does it have absolute authority over that institution, over every aspect of it? No. We can still say the state grants uh, 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 marriage licenses. Even in an old Catholic state like Malta, you go, you're going to get a civil license. It depends upon who was the court of the first jurisdiction on that. The church likes to be the first to give the recognition of the marriage. Uh, in many regimes, we're not only the first, but we also sign off for the temporal government as a, as a civil kind of thing. Uh, when it comes to questions of matrimony in the courts, we ask that the ecclesial court be the court of first instance. So as I understand it in Malta, even after World War II, they had a democratic Republican constitution. But they had comedy of jurisdictions on matrimony. So Catholics, when there was a matrimonial dispute, uh, went to a tribunal. And it's after the tribunal did its work that the civil government of Malta had something to do. If you weren't Catholic, you go to the civil government. But there are so many different arrangements historically in different times and places but when it comes to the ordinary powers, the sacramental powers, uh, apostolic authority, uh, the church has been making basically the same argument over generations and generations. Uh, the state shouldn't be fiddling around with apostolic succession or the, the sacrament of marriage or baptism and, the, and these sorts of things. But I would be a I would be a seventy four year old fool if I if I sat here and told you that this is simple stuff. You know, when Thomas was alive, uh, Western Europe, for the first time in its history, had two systems of law, and people like Thomas of Becket had a degree in both canonical and civil. By, by the end of the 12th century, Western Europe is a legally really complicated place. Everyone knows how to make legal arguments because of the recovery of Roman law, the first compilation of canon law, although it was not a code, by, by Gratian. Uh, so when you put really smart people who have law degrees, civil and canonical, discussing an issue of courts, and what's the court of first instance? You're going to have a complicated story. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so we started with the discussion of renative and political prudence. And as we wind down here for, for a final question, in light of what you just said regarding this interaction, and specifically as it uh, centers on the institution of marriage, I'm wondering, you know, like Catholics are thinking practically in the 21st century as the state makes incursions uh, upon what was perhaps more easily recognizable as an institution of marriage more in accord with what the church describes as marriage. So there may be ways, you know, like you can think about no fault divorce, way, way in which those visions had gradually come apart in the 20th century, but it seems not only have they come apart, but they've been, they've been shorn. Um, so are there, are there ways like in her prudence uh, that the church and her members uh, will kind of enter into the public square, engage in that debate about marriage, which are conditioned by the peculiar factors of this, you know, as St. Paul said, present evil age. Um, is, there, is there something that's changed that informs our prudence, which makes it such that we engage in a distinct way? Or, or is that to be too, I don't know, um, to be too desperate in our approach? Uh, fantastic question. And it's one that has to come 50 plus years after Dignitatis Humanae. The question has to be asked very seriously because it does involve prudence. Should our lead move vis a vis Caesar be rights of conscience, natural law, even that of marriage, or even jus gentium? Or should our first move be the gospel itself? Now, dignitatis allows both moves, because the first part of dignitatis is in uh, the light of reason. And uh, the second part is sub luce revelationis, in the light of revelation. I mean, we have more than one way, and sometimes Caesar has to be told not just the moral truth, but the more full truth that we believe in. And I think that's what Jesus did in, in the court of Pilate, right? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. He said, if it were, you'd be in trouble. Remember? He, he lays it out. And uh, he talks about the truth. And Pilate says, what is truth? And Jesus basically says, he's standing in front of you. I am the truth. So both ways are necessary, and it does require prudence, uh, no doubt. Um, what more can I say? If I really know, knew how to unpack all of that prudence in a book, I would do it, and my grandchildren would have a very happy and prosperous life from my <laughs> royalties. But I'm not that good. No, it's, you're, you're quite good. That, that actually leads to a, a good kind of concluding note. Um, I was thinking of resources, uh, things to which you've contributed, or books or articles that you've written apropos of the theme which would benefit our listeners kind of going forward. I, I read uh, First Grace, um, which was very helpful in this regard, thinking about natural law arguments in the context of the American jurisprudential setting. But are there other things that you might recommend, things that you've worked on, which will be a benefit to our listeners? Well, I think there is a, an article, uh, a rather long one too, uh, that's right on the Vatican website uh, under social sciences. It's called The Coherence of the Principles of Catholic Social Doctrine. It's, it's like a small book, but uh, I will soon have a book coming out on Catholic University Press, the title, of, the title of which is On the Dignity of Society, and be covering many different aspects of Catholic social teaching, including a reworked or at least longer and more complicated version of the talk I gave a Catholic you two months ago on how to inherit a kingdom. All right. Well, thank, thanks so much for dedicating the time to continuing the conversation. I certainly benefited from it. And I know that the listeners of the Thomistic Institute podcast will as well. 
So turning now to you, the listener, thanks so much for having tuned in. Uh, if you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the Thomistic Institute podcast, whether on YouTube or on your podcast app. And uh, yep, know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us. And we'll look forward to chatting with you next time at the Thomistic Institute podcast. Thank you.